Hello everyone, and I'm delighted to be here. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about futures anthropology, emerging technologies, and anticipating experience. And I, I think from the last presentation we saw that people working outside academia in a really exciting field of mobility as a service are starting to think about futures. In fact, people working in industry have thought about futures much more often than social scientists and anthropologists have. And what I want to talk to you about today is a futures anthropology and a collaborative anthropology that can actually keep up with that pace, can collaborate with our colleagues in industry and make a contribution by shifting its emphasis towards the future and collaborating and participating in shaping some of those futures. Futures relating to mobility as a service, but also other aspects of our technological futures. And putting, in doing so, putting people at the center of those futures that we can imagine technology making a difference to. Technology is making no difference now. <laughs> can I have help with my next slide? Is that one? No. <laughs> Thank you. Or maybe I... No. Okay, no, that's it. Thank you. So what we're finding in contemporary times is that social scientists are looking at our world and we're actually seeing that changes are happening around us that we're not participating in, that they're actually going ahead. We're not being consulted, we're not being involved. Futures are being talked about that we don't see our work being represented in when utopian futures and dystopian futures start to be represented in the media. What we actually see, though, we see what happens in everyday life. We see that utopian and dystopian futures aren't happening in, in those everyday circumstances that we research. Actually, we're seeing people improvising, keeping going, stopping their own world's ending, by doing the things they need to do to get to the next step in their everyday life circumstances. But there's an interesting question here because we're confronted with these futures and we feel as anthropologists that we're not shaping them, we're not participating them in them enough. But how do we do that as anthropologists? Anthropology doesn't really have a traditional methodology or method or technique for doing this. So we need to do something else. We need to create what we can call anticipatory anthropologies and ethnographies, approaches to understanding the future and what's happening, what might happen next, rather than just what's already happened. It means we need to have new concepts or concepts that we use differently. We need to think about trust and anxiety and hope and to think about how we encounter those imagined futures that we haven't yet experienced or may never experience but yet are possible through those feelings, those feelings in our bodies as well as things that we can talk about. So what we need then, and this is for the academics here, how many people here are academics or social scientists? Great, so probably about half. So this is what we as social scientists need. We actually need a qualitative futures research movement. Now we know that predictive um, approaches to futures can lead to failure. If you predict a future, but you can never really know if it will happen, then that can lead to bad investments. Um, it can lead to assumptions that might crumble, and it can lead to things going wrong. So in other circumstances, we can assume that we have futures laid out for us, and then something will happen that will divert them. We'll feel as if our futures have been taken away, but we, they haven't been taken away. In fact, they never existed already. There were just things that we'd assumed would happen in the future. So how can the social science contribute to this context? We need to contribute. We need to participate. We need to actually go beyond our traditional ethnographic methods. And we actually need to start playing in the same space as other disciplines that already think that they can work in the future. So disciplines like design, economics, predictive data analytics, all of the academics and researchers and people in industry contexts who are using those methods think that they can intervene in what's going to happen next. So anthropologists 
need to moderate those spaces. We need to become engaged, we need to become involved, which means we, start, we need to do anthropology differently sometimes if we want to play in those spaces with them and have some influence and have some impact. Now, so this last slide shows a little bit the progress of ethnography. That's our favorite method as anthropologists. And you can see that we've thought about the role of gender, we've thought about the role of the internet, we've thought about the role of sex, we've thought about the role of sensory experience, we've thought about the role of the video camera and visual approaches, we thought about the digital, we thought about design. But what about thinking about futures? For me, that's the next step that social sciences needs to take. And when we take that step properly, then I think we'll be fully engaged with other organizations in the world, our industry partners, our policy par partners, and we'll be able to truly become involved in the work that they're doing. This is what anthropologists have really traditionally done with futures. We've studied the uncertainty of what might be going to happen next. What we've studied, though, is the way that people cope with uncertainty. Traditionally, um, accusations of witchcraft or oracles and forms of divination are the ways that anthropologists have looked at uncertainty. We've looked at how people in different cultures actually cope with not knowing what's going to happen next through such rituals and such activities. Um, we've studied uncertainty and how it's experienced in, in the most recent past. How do people cope with types of economic crisis? How do people cope with insecurity and uncertainty in their employment situations? But what we really haven't done enough of is to actually ask how can we engage with uncertainty as anthropologists as a way of thinking about futures and a way of intervening in futures and a way of participating with other disciplines to actually make our understanding of uncertainty much, much more relevant and to play a role in moderating the assumptions and the certainties that others try to insert into their beliefs about the future and the future scenarios they present us with. So there's time for a change. It's time for a change in the social sciences, but it's also time for a change in the role that the social sciences can play in society. It's time for a change in, in the approach of government and policymakers and industry in terms of how they think about us. I think that we need to put people at the center of our work and many of those organizations appreciate that they're things that they don't know because they don't understand people well enough. Anthropologists have all of the knowledge and the tools and the skills to be able to bring that knowledge into a really fruitful relationship with others, but to do it in the future rather than just doing it in the present. Now, I talked about uncertainty and how anthropologists then are very good at understanding uncertainty. Understanding uncertainty is so important because the methods that tend to be used to understand the future usually are methods that involve this list of things. So, prediction. Prediction is about objectification. It actually turns something into a fixed certainty, something that's stuck in a moment in the future. This will happen then. We don't know if that will happen then. We don't know if anything will happen in any moment. Um, this crystallization of a future, again, seeing the future as something that's stopped and fixed in time somewhere. The ethics of a future. How can we actually think about a future ethically? That's another role that anthropologists can contribute. What about the power relations of the future? And what about the failures that will occur if anthropologists don't participate in the future? Personas are a really good example. Personas are part of a predictive future or objectified futures that designers very often create. They don't acknowledge the uncertainty that anthropologists acknowledge. Anthropologists will argue against objectification, will argue against personas, will argue against crystallization, will argue for ethics, will argue for shifting the power relationships, new modes of responsibility. So we're quite challenging in that sense. We're quite difficult. But the fact that we're difficult makes our contribution all the more valuable. Now, one example, and this is the cat. Dan promised a cat. There's probably always a cat when we're thinking about the internet. And um, this cat actually is my cat. And um, the point about this picture is that he's looking really happy and contented um, because he lives in a home. And um, when you have a pet, 
and you keep the pet in the home, it's important for you to make sure that your home is suitable for your pet. Now, one of the interesting things that my colleagues who I've been working with in Australia have been discovering in their research about people and pets in their homes is that when it gets really hot, people are starting to put their air conditioning on for their pets and actually keeping their pets cool in their homes when they're out. Now, that's really interesting because it's a very um, hidden and unknown about way by energy companies um, that people are actually using energy. It's creating new forms of energy demand that are hidden. And it's a new form of energy demand that's actually created by people and what people are doing. If we don't understand those kinds of things, then how are we actually going to know how energy demand might change in the future as new things start to happen in people's homes? Maybe people start to care for their pets differently maybe they need more energy, or maybe other everyday practices will emerge that we don't yet know about, but that we can maybe think about better if we try to understand how people envisage their futures and what they're likely to do as they move on into their everyday futures. Um, what tends to happen is that actually, if we only use um, approaches to modeling futures that don't account for people, what people need and what people want, that can often lead to failure because what people are really going to do, how people will improvise as they move on in their lives to make things work for them, is not accounted for. And can, that can lead to failure. For example, it could lead to infrastructure failure if the wrong investments are made and um, everybody uses their electricity at the same time and the energy system breaks down. So we need to think really carefully about why we need to account for people, what people, what people will do in the future, but also who's responsible for that kind of work and how we might do it. Now, with the groups of people I've worked with in different contexts, we've tried to think about that, that in quite a lot of depth and to develop new research methods within anthropology and design through which we can ask those questions. Now, Design Anthropology, the Design Anthropological Futures book, is um, written by and, and edited by a group of people I know in Denmark, which is an absolutely excellent book, and it really starts to ask how anthropology and design can come together. Design is a future-focused discipline. Anthropology has always been a past-focused past discipline. Um, another group of us has developed a movement called the Future Anthropologies Network, and we've edited this book called about anthropologies and futures, which really asks the question of what research methods can we use as anthropologists to engage with futures? really try to push that on. And then, with other colleagues, we've started to really explore the question of the concept of uncertainty and possibility. How can we think beyond prediction to think towards possibility? How can we use uncertainty as a way of actually understanding what's going to happen next, and actually thinking about the future through uncertainty rather than through certainty? And to stop searching for certainty. So how can we create possibilities? How can we imagine and how can we sense the unknown? How can we use these concepts of hope, trust, anxiety? How can we think of those as anticipatory feelings through which we might experience the sense of what the future might feel like? So what we've tried to do is to inspire new research methods and new approaches to understanding futures. Sometimes we've worked with designers and architects who've created prototypes, as in this picture. This is something called the FabPod that was developed at RMIT University, which is the previous university I worked in. And I worked in that project with um, architects and acoustic engineers to actually try to study how an acoustically tuned prototype meeting pod actually might be experienced by the people who engaged with it and used it in their everyday lives, but also how the use of it might enable them to imagine a different future for it, where it would play a particular role in their lives that would be more useful. This is how we work together, sitting in there together to develop creative, futuristic stories that we wrote about the future experience of it and what it might feel like. But a lot of my research has been about mobilities and driving. So linking with the last presentation, it's really exciting to start thinking now about how we might move in the future, how it might be different, how we might use self-driving cars, how we might combine them with other types of autonomous vehicles, that might be shuttles or buses, how we might use trains and bikes and walking in relation to that. But the thing at the center of all of those questions is actually how will people engage with that future and how will they experience it? What will it be like 
to be in a self-driving car? And how can we start to imagine how that will feel so that we can actually plan for the way in which those vehicles and the experience of using them and the services that are connected with them, like the way we might use our smartphone instead of our car key, how can we actually consider how they should best be designed for people so that people can use them to create their own objectives, as well as creating this shared objective of improving how wider mobility systems and services work and reducing congestion and traffic in our cities? That's all about putting people at the centre, but also, as Dan was saying, connecting with the planet. So thinking about people, but also our future shared environments that people will share with cars and with animals. So we've been developing methods that have involved us driving with people in their daily commutes, trying to understand how they use existing autonomous features in their cars and what that feels like, how they already use them, and how they feel about them, how they feel about the data that they're already contributing, that's being taken from them, and that they're using when they use um, automated apps on their phones. How are people experiencing the beginning at this shift towards new mobility systems? And what can that tell us about how people will experience it, engage with it as it moves on into the future? And then what can that tell us about how technologies can be, should be designed? This is um, actually, we, we see so many futuristic um, images and which try to tell us what our futures will look like. Does anybody know who, who wasn't at my previous talk? Does anybody know what this is? Where it is? It looks like it's in the US, but it isn't. Um, looks like it's fronts, but they're not. So this is actually a site where um, testing is done in Sweden. It's the Swedish woods in the background, and the shop fronts aren't shop fronts. They're pretend shop fronts from the US. So it's a very interesting place if you want to think about a globalized world. And, um, but this is actually also where some of our experiences of the future already occur. So our experiences of possible futures. This is where people, um, people have tested um, simulated self-driving cars. It's where people get to experience what things that don't exactly, actually really exist in their everyday lives might feel like. So another way that we can carry out research is to work with um, car companies and technology designers and engineers. So we can actually ask people to experience technologies before those technologies become an everyday reality. We can see what those experiences feel like, and we can use our insights into how those experiences are actually sensed and felt in people's bodies, and the feelings of hope or trust or anxiety that they engender. We can use those to also feed back into this big question of how should we design future mobility systems so that they will mean something to those of us who in the future will be using them and engaging with them. Now, what do we do with all of that work? Well, there are many ways in which we as anthropologists can communicate our work and use our work with industry partners, with policy makers, and with a whole range of external partners. Traditionally, we've written a lot of academic papers, and we do write a lot of academic papers about how we see futures and our concepts of uncertainty and our concepts of hope and trust, and we love doing that. And the reason why we love doing that is because it helps us to think really, really deeply about the research we do. But once we've done that, we want to bring that work back into a more public domain and an industry-focused domain, and we want to connect it to our external partners. So we do that by creating a range of materials which can support that. We've been creating all kinds of really exciting materials like innovative journey maps, which encompass routines as well as journeys. Um, we also use short video clips, which I call incisive clips, which really get to the point by showing something surprising. Not surprising for anthropologists, because we always know that something surprising is going to emerge from our work. We always know that the thing that we didn't ask about, the thing that we, couldn't, we could never have already known about that emerges from under the surface of our investigations is something that's going to be a key insight in our research. But how do we bring that into other domains? Well, so as I said, we use incisive video clips. We've been making these design cards, which we've been using to share our findings from our research project. They include insightful quotes from our participants. They include our observations. They include questions about what futures might be like informed by our research findings. We use those to share in small, short, accessible ways the findings of our research. And we develop workshops. We go beyond what normal anthropology would be to collaborate with designers to create the circumstances 
in which others can learn with us, but also in which we can learn from them and we can collaborate with them. And this is also an example of what future anthropology looks like. The lone anthropologist, is that's what everybody thinks about anthropologists, that we go and do our research alone and we go somewhere far away and we focus on the past very often too. But we don't. Not now, not always. Some people still do, but there's a new anthropology whereby we work in teams like this. And this is actually quite a small team compared with some of the other teams I've worked in. And in this team are our colleagues from Volvo Cars. We have a colleague who's an artist. We have a sociologist, a pedagogue, an anthropologist. We have designers. Um, so we work across disciplines and we learn from each other. And together we collaborate to produce new ideas and new insights. This is one of the latest projects that we're working on at the moment. This is our mobility as a service project. And in this project, we collaborate with two cities and with Volvo Cars and Halmstad University in Sweden, where our project's based, and my own work from Monash University. In this project, the, um, the second part of the, the title of the project is called A Human Approach. And we call it the AHA project. It's, and the AHA moments in research is also so fundamental to the way we work. This is a picture from a workshop where we were working together in, in teams composed of people from all of our partners, bringing together the knowledge that we've created through our ethnographic research and using that as a way in which to bring together the concerns and the interests of people from industry and people from policy in order to think about how we design new mobility as a service systems in cities. And this is the bigger team that collaborated for our last workshop. So, Anthropology has gone from looking like the one lone anthropologist sitting by his tent somewhere remote to the anthropologist sitting there in the middle of a great diverse group of people from different disciplines, from different sectors, and who are now able to start talking to each other and to start to create and plan a future together, but a future in which we put people and their needs and their desires and their possible futures right at the center. This is also an approach which is about ethics, because if you take people and their subje subjectivity and their feelings and put them at the center of your designs, you're also thinking about an ethical future, creating an ethical approach. So I'm from the Emerging Technologies Research Lab at Monash University, which I founded very recently, in the last year. And um, I wanted to end by just talking a little bit about what we do. Because we work with a series of programs in different areas of research. I've talked a bit about our work, on, our work on mobilities and our collaboration in Sweden in that work. But when we think about the way that we work as anthropologists, another way to think about a change in the way social scientists might work with futures is to shift the way in which, as one anthropologist, you focused on one area, one group of people, one community for your whole career, and actually start thinking about anthropology as a practice that can bring together insights from a whole range of different areas and to start to understand the, the meta situation much more clearly. Because of the depth of our insights, for example, our work about emerging technologies, it's really important for us to understand what's happening under the surface as we imagine people's mobility futures. But can we really separate people's mobility futures and the te technological futures there with their digital health futures? because autonomous driving vehicles and mobility as a service can play a key role in future health. Um, but can we separate any of that from energy futures? Because the energy that's going to be used to power those technologies and also the energy that might be produced by those technologies is also inextricable from those other parts. The question of the e-waste and the sustainability that would become part of those futures as well is essential for us to think about. We want to put people at the center of all of those questions and those themes and programs that my colleagues are working on. And we want to use that to think about a really core cool question which, as I said before, links with Dan's point about the, the planet. Because it's not just people, it's about the environments we live in. And the other essential research program we work on is something we called Future Shared Environments. And our future shared environments are, are really what we need to ensure are, are healthy and ethical and sustainable and right for us to live in as people. And we need to make sure that people have a role in determining that. And we as anthropologists have a role in ensuring that that happens. So what next for the social sciences? 
The social sciences, I think, needs to push forward with an agenda that will enable us to participate more and more deeply. We need to start to account for futures in our projects. I think that every social science research project that's undertaken now should have at least a small element where it starts to consider implications for our futures. We need to think about these concepts of uncertainty, possibility, hope, trust and anxiety and, and think about how we can use them as a way of actually pushing our research forward into that future context. We need to contest those narratives of predictive futures disciplines. It doesn't mean we need to go into a fighting mode against them and declare that they're all wrong, but we need to collaborate with people who work in disciplines that use predictive modes to help them not to, do, not to make assumptions that will ultimately lead to failure. We need to work with them in order to moderate prediction um, and to try to think about how more plausible futures could be understood through considerations of uncertainty and the way that humans will improvise to move into their futures as we go forward. I think we need to think of then call for new practice and thinking outside academia so that our approaches can be accounted for. Finally, we need to collaborate to get out of the university. That doesn't mean we don't need to do the work we already do in our universities, and I really want to break down that divide between the idea of an applied anthropologist who does work in industry and an academic anthropologist who doesn't. I think that the thing that makes anthropologists special is the fact that we are anthropologists, that we do think theoretically, we do think critically, we don't just compile information and get insights from it. We actually think deeply and critically about the work we do, and if, when we do that, that's when we can bring the insights that really, really help to make the way in which we collectively move on forward into our futures with industry and other partners better, more responsible, more ethical, and hopefully more comfortable for us to live in. So thank you.